Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Melissa Sheth from Madison, Wisconsin. I'm a veterinarian, recently graduated from the UW School of Veterinary Medicine, and it is my pleasure to introduce Clinical Instructor of Zoological Medicine, Dr. Mary Thurber, a board certified specialist in zoological medicine. Today, she will be sharing with us the story of her career journey, some examples of interesting cases at the zoo, and a bit about the vet school's student and resident training programs. Mary received her Bachelor of Science at Stanford University and is a graduate of the UW School of Veterinary Medicine, yay! <laughs> Following her residency at UC Davis and the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, she served as a staff veterinarian at the Oakland Zoo. Please welcome Dr. Mary Thurber. Thank you so much for the introduction, Melissa, um, and thank you very much for having me here on Badger Talks Live. Today, I'm going to talk about a day in the life of a zoo veterinarian. So just a quick outline of my talk today. Um, I will discuss how I got into my role as a zoo veterinarian, what the different roles are as a zoo veterinarian, although certainly not an exhaustive list. And I'll talk about um, a day in the life of a zoo vet and go through a couple of different examples of cases we see at the vet school, or sorry, at the zoo, um, and go into detail about an example case um, that we saw not too long ago, a seal named Sparky, who uh, was under anesthesia for a dental procedure. So just a little bit about me. I grew up here in Madison, Wisconsin. I was really fortunate to have the vet school just down the road, um, and I was lucky as a kid to get to um, do some really interesting opportunities at the vet school, such as meeting this fistulated cow as a kid. Um, after I finished my high school here in Madison, I went out to California. I went to Stanford University for college. I was really fortunate during my time there to spend parts of two summers in Namibia, studying elephant behavior and parasitic infections. Um, and I was able to write that project up as my honors thesis and it Really, truly, it was part of the inspiration for me to pursue conservation um, research and medicine and a, a career in zoo medicine. I was really excited to come back to Madison for my vet school degree. While I was here um, at the vet school, I really learned what it meant to be a zoo veterinarian, and I was lucky to have a lot of exposure to some of the different areas of zoo and wildlife medicine. So I was a part of our Zoo and Wildlife Medicine Club or WEZAM. I attended the annual Zoo Vet Conference um, and that's through the American Association of Zoo Veterinarians. I volunteered at our local wildlife rehabilitation center, the Dane, Dane County Humane Society's Wildlife Center. And during my fourth year, I was able to visit several different zoos and wildlife centers um, to learn what it meant to be a zoo veterinarian at those different facilities. During vet school, I continued my interest in conservation and wildlife research. I was really fortunate to work with Dr. Tony Goldberg um, as a part of his Kabali Eco Health Project. And I studied hemoparasitic infections in primates or parasites that infect red blood cells. I also did a separate project looking at avian malaria in wild and zoo birds. And then during my fourth year, I wrote up a clinical case series with my mentor, Dr. Christoph Mons looking at uh, anti-mortem diagnosis of hydrocephalus in African gray parrots. After vet school, so after I became a veterinarian, I did a one-year internship in small animal medicine and surgery at the University of Tennessee College of Veterinary Medicine. After that year, I matched to a three-year residency program in zoological medicine and that was through the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine and the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. At, um, during that residency, I spent the first year up at UC Davis in the Sacramento Zoo. The second year was at the San Diego Zoo and the third year was at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. And I was also fortunate to spend a few months at the um, SeaWorld in San Diego and the Marine Mammal Center up in Sausalito. After completing my residency, I sat the board exam um, that would make me a board certified specialist in zoological medicine, I was fortunate to pass. So I'm a diplomat of the American College of Zoological Medicine. After completing my residency program, I worked at the Oakland Zoo for a year. 
And then I was really excited to see this job opportunity pop back up in Madison. Um, and so I was able to get the job working as a clinical instructor of zoological medicine here at the UW uh, School of Veterinary Medicine. In this role, I'm a part of our zoological medicine service. So we currently have four, soon to be five faculty members, as well as a really robust training program. Um, we currently have four residents and one intern. Our residents get to work, actually all of our uh, house officers get to work uh, not only here, but also at the Milwaukee County Zoo and the International Crane Foundation. So it's a really unique uh, zoological medicine residency. I am also the primary veterinarian for the Henry Vilas Zoo. So Henry Vilas Zoo is a wonderful AZA accredited uh, zoo here in Madison. It is a free zoo, it's open to everybody. Um, and we are really lucky to have a wonderful hospital on zoo grounds uh, called the Animal Health Center. During non-COVID times, it is open for people to come view it through the window as well. A really big part of my role here at the vet school is training future zoo vets whether it means that they become an actual zoo veterinarian working at a zoo or rel related institution, or if it's somebody who goes into general practice but is able to help out zoo or wildlife animals as well. In my position, I've created a new zoological medicine rotation um, for both fourth year veterinary students as well as our house officers, so our residents and our interns. And this allows them to get exposure to the medical management of zoo and wildlife animals at a variety of institutions, such as the Henry Vilas Zoo, the McKenzie Center, the Oxnard Park Zoo, and the Dane County Humane Society's Wildlife Center. In case you don't recognize her, this is Melissa here on the right. Um, she got to come through our rotation this year, past year. So how are zoo vets different than your typical dog and cat vet? Well, one big difference is that we see literally all the animals in the zoo. So all animals, all creatures, great and small, whether it's a tiny salamander to a polar bear, or depending on where you're working, you know, giraffes and elephants, could even be aquatic animals like sharks or seals. So because of this, we take care of patients that are a huge range of sizes. And we also see a really big variety of anatomy, physiology, which causes significant differences in terms of their medicine and surgery and anesthesia, along with their nutrition and husbandry and so on. Additionally, um, because our animals are essentially wild animals, we aren't always able to evaluate them before they undergo anesthesia. So while a dog or a cat could go to the vet and have a thorough physical exam or have their blood drawn um, just using manual restraint, a lot of our animals, we can't do that. Um, so they will actually undergo anesthesia prior to having some of those assessments, which can make our job a little bit trickier or potentially more unpredictable. In addition, some of our animals are venomous, thinking about like a rattlesnake, for example, or could hurt us like a lion or a polar bear. Um, so there are definitely a lot of nuances in their job uh, that we have to work with, which makes it really exciting. Another thing that's different between animals at the zoo and your pets at home um, is that a lot of our animals won't necessarily take a medication reliably. We might give them a prescription, um, you know, a dog or a cat, you could hide a pill in a little pill pocket or a treat. Um, you can't always do that for an animal, say like a flamingo, that's kind of a filter feeder. You might actually have to either catch the bird and do an injection or tube feed them. So sometimes you need to weigh the pros and cons of administering treatments to our animals. So what are the roles of a zoo veterinarian? And certainly they are very wide and varied, uh, but probably the first and foremost thing you think of is being a clinical practitioner. So we uh, do a lot of preventive medicine in zoos. So routine health assessments, giving vaccines, um, preventing parasite infections, evaluating nutrition, things like that, that are really important for keeping our animals healthy. When we do have a sick animal, it's a very big part of our job to diagnose and treat diseases. We're also practicing a lot of emergency medicine, such as if there's an injury. Another big thing um, that's really important to zoos is actually moving animals between zoos, um, often for recommendations for breeding, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Anytime that we're moving an animal between different zoos, we'll have them undergo a pre-shipment exam. So we'll make sure that that animal is healthy and can undergo shipment and relocation. And then once they actually arrive at their new zoo, they undergo a quarantine period. So there'll often be a quarantine exam as well. 
a really big important part of our job is communication. Um, not only with the animal management team, such as like the curators, your director, um, but also the animal care staff that is providing the, the care for these animals. They're really the eyes and ears on the ground um, evaluating their animals. And it's really important that we have really good um, communication with them. So the zoo vets are also part of the animal management team. So we are part of different animal health discussion, whether it's making recommendations for how to get hands on an animal or how we should treat an animal, things we need to change in their environment. Another really important role um, and really exciting thing um, in zoo medicine is medical behavior training. So like I was saying, a lot of our animals, you can't necessarily manually restrain to get a blood draw. So let's say a lion, um, but you actually can train them and they can voluntary, voluntarily participate in things like blood draw. So for example, a lion might voluntarily pass its tail through its enclosure and allow us to get a blood draw um, after a lot of training. So it's really a really beneficial um, behavior for these animals. Other things they might do is um, do voluntary weights or participate in voluntary injections so we can give them their vaccines or even an anesthesia injection. Another important part of a zoo vet role is zoonotic disease prevention. So zoonotic disease is something that comes from an animal to a human. So if we were to diagnose a disease in an, in an animal that might be zoonotic, it's really important that we communicate well, uh, not only with the management team, but with, also with the keepers to make sure everyone understands how to prevent the spread of this disease. Zoo vets can also be involved in exhibit design. So if we're lucky to have a new exhibit built, we can help strategize you know, different things that would make it potentially either safer for the animal or things that might help us in terms of their medical management. Zoo vets can also be members of conservation management groups. So the Association of Zoos and Aquariums or AZA um, is the overarching accreditation um, for zoos. And they, there are hundreds of species survival plans. Um, and so that means that species, let's say a rhino, um, the goal of the SSP species survival plan is to maintain a sustainable, healthy, genetically diverse and demographically varied population in zoos all across America in AZA zoos. This is a large collaboration between population and reproductive management centers, program leaders, institution representatives and vet advisors. So veterinarians who work in zoos who are experts um, for that species can make recommendations to others who are working with that species in different zoos um, such that we can really have the most healthy population of animals and zoos across the world, which is really great. Another really important role, role of the zoo veterinarian is being an educator, whether it is working directly with vet students, interns and residents, um, or even the general public. So these photos show different um, examples. On the left, one of our interns is drawing blood from our Aldabra tortoise, the next photo, um, our, one of our residents is doing an exam um, on a, uh, a small primate. And then here we have a, a red panda under anesthesia and we also have a student helping us monitor anesthesia. So these are really important um, for our students, interns and residents to learn how to get these animals safely under anesthesia, how to do a complete physical exam, how to collect different samples like blood samples and take images like x-rays and ultrasound to learn, you know, how to find out whether or not these animals are healthy or not and how we can best treat them and manage them. In addition, we're often able to educate the general public, which is really exciting and, and a way to get them inspired to contribute to conservation and protect these animals for generations to come. So you can see here, this is from inside the treatment room at the Henry Vila Zoo um, Animal Health Center. And so the general public is actually able to see through this window and watch some of our procedures um, during non-COVID times. And right here, one of our veterinary technicians, Mark, um, is doing a dental cleaning for one of our animals. So zoo vets are also often um, contributing to research and field work. Um, so lots of different projects can be um, sort of managed by zoo veterinarians. These are just a completely non-exhaustive list, so we can develop reference intervals, um, investigate different disease outbreaks, develop and evaluate anesthesia protocols for different species, write up case series looking at morbidity or mortality events, 
studying different drug pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and so much more. It's a really important part of our job because we have literally hundreds and thousands of species of animals in zoos and we can't possibly know everything. And so the more we can learn, the better we can help these animals. So let's talk about a day in the life of a zoo vet. And I will start right off the bat by saying every day is different. So I definitely can't tell you a standard day. But in general, we do try to start off our morning. Um, all of the people working in the hospital that day, which will often be a veterinarian, um, potentially a resident, a vet student, and then uh, our vet technicians who are part of the zoo staff, a really instrumental part of our team. Um, so we'll often meet in the morning, sort of talk about our plan for the day, the different roles that we're going to have. If we have animals in the hospital, either if they're sick or if they're in quarantine, we'll make sure to look at them, make sure that they have everything that they need for that day. Typically, if we're going to do a procedure under anesthesia, we'll do that in the morning, um, oftentimes at the hospital, but sometimes they'll be out on zoo grounds as well. We'll spend uh, the rest of the morning or the afternoon doing our visual exams or procedures on zoo grounds. Um, so in these examples, we have a porcupine getting an exam in the top photo and an otter getting a vaccine down here. And then the rest of our day we spend um, sort of in desk time. So what that means is having different meetings, writing our medical records, doing um, evaluating our diagnostic test results, writing prescriptions, coming up with our procedure plans for the next day, evaluating diets, writing papers or lectures, and so on. So I have some example photos of just some of the animals we've seen at the zoo in our hospital. So here we have a black and white rough lemur. Um, she's under anesthesia for a pre-shipment exam. So potentially going to be moving to a different zoo. So she is having a complete physical exam under anesthesia. In this photo, our intern is ultrasounding her. And you can see our vet student at the time, Melissa in the background, she's actually monitoring her vitals under anesthesia. So our, our anesthesia monitors are just off of the screen here. And she is recording her heart rate and respiratory rate, blood pressure, temperature, et cetera. This photo on the right over here, um, this is actually one of the primate, primary keepers who works with the primates. Um, and she is watching the lemur as she's waking up from anesthesia. So she's making sure that you know, she's continuing to do really well and she is able to be there and keep her calm because that's the primary person that this lemur works with. So it's a really great um, way for her to have a nice smooth recovery from anesthesia. These photos are of a red panda having a diagnostic exam under anesthesia. Um, and in the back over here, um, this is actually one of our board certified radiologists from the vet school who was able to come over and do an ultrasound on this red panda. Here we have a small marmoset under anesthesia. Uh, this is a board certified dentist who was able to come over and do a dental exam and procedure um, on this little monkey. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about him later today as well. And you'll see throughout these photos, um, we have a variety of our trainees um, that's long, along with our veterinary technician. Um, and then oftentimes you'll see um, one of our zoo managers or keepers in the background as well. Like I said, the, you know, all of these procedures really take a village is a really important uh, collaborative event. Uh, here you can see our technician cleaning the teeth of a lemur. And this photo is actually from a different zoo um, during my residency, but it's an example of a procedure we might do on zoo grounds. So an animal that might not physically be able to come to the hospital, we can do anesthesia potentially in a stall um, or an off exhibit holding space as well. So this is a talk-in that was anesthetized for a routine health exam along with a hoof trim. And then sometimes we'll also have emergencies. So this is an example of a flamingo that was noted to have a wing droop. So he was not holding his wing appropriately, which is worrisome for a potential injury. So this bird was able to come down to the hospital, um, was put under anesthesia, and we were able to do a complete exam, take x-rays and blood work, and put a bandage on his wing to help it heal appropriately. All right, so now we're gonna go really in depth into seal um, Sparky for his dental procedure. So Sparky is a 22 year old male harbor seal and he was scheduled to undergo an anesthesia procedure uh, for a dental assessment with a boarded veterinary dentist. And this is because we had noticed that he actually had fractured his lower left canine tooth. 
Berkey also had a history of bilateral cataracts, meaning that he had cataracts in both eyes. So we are gonna use this anesthesia procedure as an opportunity to have him evaluated by a board certified ophthalmologist as well. So how did we know that Sparky had fractured a tooth? And that is because we're able to observe him really closely with the keepers who work with him and because of keeper training. Like I mentioned before, having medical behaviors trained for our animals is extremely helpful for keeping them healthy. And so through uh, behaviors like an open mouth behavior, we're able to look at their teeth and make sure that everything looks okay. So here you can actually see Sparky um, while he is eating uh, and we can zoom in on these photos and you'll notice that his lower left canine tooth is broken um, and you can actually see into the tooth. Uh, the area that's darker within the center of the tooth, that's the pulp cavity um, and that's the inside of a tooth that normally is not exposed. When you have pulp exposure, um, it's an open route for a bacterial infection. So that's why it's really important that a broken tooth is evaluated and treated. So now the next question is, how do you get the seal to the vet? Um, obviously seals live in the water um, and you can't just ask them to walk down the road. So this takes a lot of planning. Um, because seals are aquatic, that means that they are wet. Um, and when you're under anesthesia, you actually can't thermoregulate very well. So it's really important that we kept him dry overnight. So the keepers were able to ask him to leave the pool and overnight he, was, he slept in a dry area so he wouldn't be wet while he was under anesthesia. To get him under anesthesia, first we gave him a hand injection with a sedative and that made him nice and sleepy. And then once he was sleepy enough, we were able to give him a supplemental drug into his bloodstream. So intravenous means into his bloodstream. Once he was fully induced under anesthesia, we were able to intubate him, which means place a breathing tube. And then we transported him to the hospital under anesthesia. So seal anatomy is extremely different <laughs> from a dog or a cat. And so actually even just getting access to the bloodstream or venous access is really quite different. One thing that's really unique about seals um, is that their spinal cord um, actually splits off pretty early in their um, thoracic spines, uh, vertebrae. And so we have a really unique access to a sinus within um, their vertebral area. So here, if we look at our lumbar vertebrae three to four, um, we can actually access a um, intervertebral epidural sinus, which is an area of blood that we can access safely. So this uh, video here actually shows a needle and some blood. So if you're at all worried, you know, maybe just avert your eyes during this part. Um, so you can see in this video that I have um, clipped the area that we're going to give him uh, the injection and we've prepped it with alcohol to clean it. So I am palpating um, for his hips and then palpating his dorsal spinous processes to find the correct location. Used a large spinal needle, uh, pulled out the stylet, attaching the syringe. And then you'll see I'll draw back and get a flash of blood so I know I'm in the right area. And I'm slowly giving the drug. And then I'll draw back, make sure that I'm still getting blood back. And then I'll finish administering the drug. Now because this is being given into a sinus, not directly into a vein, we like to follow up with IV fluids to flush the drug into the system um, so that it can get metabolized appropriately. So here I'm detaching the syringe and then attaching a fluid line so that we can flush the drug into the system. So when the seal is under anesthesia, um, we really treat him the same way you would treat a dog or a cat. So he is intubated, which means that he has a breathing tube in his throat. Um, so the tube is there to protect his airway and it allows us to, to directly administer anesthetic gas to keep him under anesthesia. We monitor his vital parameters throughout the entire procedure. So we monitor his heart rate, rhythm, his oxygenation, the amount of carbon dioxide that he's blowing off, his blood pressure, and we can also do blood gas analyses. During this procedure, we were lucky to co uh, collaborate with some of the veteran anesthesiologists from the vet school, the faculty, Dr. Tatiana Ferreira, and one of her residents, Dr. Gabby Escalante. So these photos show us intubating Sparky. Um, so you can see we use this large bite block here um, just to make sure that if you were to be a little bit light that our tube would be protected. Uh, we use a large laryngoscope blade so we can see the back of his mouth and get the tube into his airway. 
So here you can see the tube going back down into his trachea. And then we tied it onto his nose to make sure it would stay in place throughout this procedure. The seal building happens to be basically right next door to the zoo hospital. So we put Sparky onto a tarp, picked him up, put him on a rolling gurney and walked him down the road to the zoo hospital. You can see us here set up in the treatment room. Um, so we've been able to get a lot of his anesthesia monitors on, recording all of his vital parameters. And up at his head, we can see the dentist starting to do his dental exam as well. In this image, we're using an ultrasound to look for an artery so that we can collect blood for blood gas analysis. During his anesthesia procedure, we did a complete health assessment. So we collected blood to make sure that everything looked, uh, looked normal for him. We took x-rays looking at all of his um, skeleton and his, uh, his internal organs. And we also administered his vaccines. For this procedure, I was the zoo medicine faculty working um, along with one of our residents, Dr. Shauna Hawkins. We also are really lucky um, to have veterinary technicians that work for the Henry Viola Zoo. During this procedure, we had um, two working, um, Mark and Angie, which were really instrumental for this procedure. So then we also had his complete dental assessment. So similar to when you go to see the dentist, we had complete dental charting. So looking at all of his teeth, making sure that we made any notes for anything that was not normal. Um, and we took x-rays of his mouth, so intraoral radiographs. For this procedure, we are very lucky um, to have one of the faculty from the vet school, Dr. Chris Snyder, a board certified dentist um, for this procedure. So during his dental evaluation, um, he found several concerns. So we obviously knew about the fractured lower left canine. Unfortunately, he found that he actually had also fractured his upper left canine with evidence of infection for both. Um, and then both the upper and lower first left premolars also looked non-vital or no longer alive. So for all four of these teeth, it was recommended that they be extracted. Throughout any type of a procedure, we try to involve the uh, animal care staff or the keepers who work at the zoo. So you can see here two of the primary keepers who work with the seals. Dr. Snyder was showing them um, his findings and talking about what the recommendation is gonna be. It's really important so that they know what's going on with their animal and they're you know a really important part of the aftercare so we love making sure that they're a part of the procedure so these images um, show some of the changes we found with his teeth so for his upper left canine um, you can see there's a tiny little black dot in the middle of that tooth on the tip of the tooth so that um, means that he's actually broken off the tip of that tooth and he now has pulp exposure so the pulp is the inside of that tooth and having exposure means that there's an open route for infection. Here again, we can see the lower left canine tooth, which was very obviously broken um, and also had pulp exposure. So dental x-rays are really crucial for evaluating tooth health. So we were able to take a complete set of intraoral radiographs or x-rays for Sparky. So this is um, the x-ray for his right upper canine, which was normal and healthy. So this is the canine tooth and up here is the root of the tooth up in his mouth. In comparison, we have the uh, unhealthy left upper canine. So one of the differences you can see is this area that's um, gray in the middle of the tooth, that is the pulp chamber. So it's much wider here than here. Um, so that means that this tooth is no longer alive. We also have an irregular edge to the root. Uh, so it's not nice and smooth. This means that we have started to have some resorption of the root of that tooth. The area that's gray around here is called a periapicolucency. Um, and what that means is that there's an infection. So we would say that we have evidence for a tooth root abscess or infection of this tooth. Similarly, we have the unhealthy lower left canine. Um, here you can see that this tooth is fractured. We again have a very wide pulp chamber. And then we also have root resorption um, and a large lucency down here in the bone um, due to the draining tract. In this x-ray, we can also see the first premolar and it's actually no longer well embedded in the bone. Um, and so it's non-vital um, and should be taken out. Just a quick warning that we do have a little bit of blood in the next two photos. So if you don't want to see them, just maybe close your eyes for a minute. 
Uh, so this is just showing some of the, the steps of the extraction. So again, we can see our fractured lower left canine and then our sort of displaced um, first premolar. So here, Dr. Schneider is using a dental elevator to um, break down some of the attachments so he can take that tooth out. So here you can see um, the teeth that have been successfully extracted. Uh, he did a wonderful job. And um, if you notice on this tooth um, that's been extracted, there's this abnormal sort of gray discoloration to the tip of the tooth, and that's evidence for infection. So we were able to get a sample of this for culture to make sure that we were using the appropriate antibiotics. After he extracted these teeth, um, you can see that they were closed with sutures or stitches, and he made sure to use an absorbable suture material so that over time, as the tissue heals, the sutures will actually fall out on their own. So he does not need to have his stitches removed again, which is very helpful um, so that we don't have to anesthetize him for that. So anytime you take out a tooth, you want to make sure to take a follow-up x-ray to make sure that you got the entire tooth out. It's a really important thing to do. So these are our pre-extraction radiographs. So here again, we have our left upper canine and first premolar. And here is our post radiograph. Um, so you can see the teeth are completely gone, perfect. And then we have our lower left canine um, and first premolar in the second, second radiograph. Um, and here you can see they've been fully extracted with no remnants. So that's exactly what we would want to see. So after this procedure, um, Sparky received 10 days of pain medication. It was recommended because he had the stitches in his mouth um, that he should be fed a soft diet. So normally seals would eat a, a whole fish um, and that could potentially cause some trauma to those sutures. So it was recommended to give him basically a gruel consistency diet or blended up fish. We gave him antibiotics based off of his culture and sensitivity results. And it was really important we asked the keepers to monitor him closely and make sure he didn't have any evidence of any oral discomfort and make sure there was no evidence that he might have something like an oral nasal fistula, um, something like sneezing after he ate or drank. It would make us worry that there could be a connection between his mouth and his nose because of that infected tooth that we took out. Fortunately, there were no concerns and he healed very well. So during this anesthesia procedure, we also had Sparky undergo a complete eye exam. So that would include things like evaluating the front and back of his eye, looking at his lenses, evaluating his tear production, as well as the pressure or intraocular pressure of his eyes. Of course, under anesthesia, it's a little bit different than doing a complete exam awake. For example, we can't test whether or not he can see uh, because he is under anesthesia and he can't react to things that we do. However, we can evaluate his vision while he's awake. And we know that he has a history of cataracts, um, but he does still have vision. For this procedure, we were fortunate to consult with um, our board certified ophthalmologist from the vet school, Dr. Ellison Bentley. And she brought along two residents, Dr. Kevin Snyder and Dr. Vanessa Yang. So during the exam, um, they were able to confirm that he has bilateral cataracts. It is difficult to tell in this photo of his eye and his pupil is very, very small. Um, but in this area, you can see this is his tiny, tiny pupil. Um, this little area is gray um, and that is because he has a cataract in his lens. On his right eye, um, there was this little area that was gray. And so they did a fluorescein stain. That's what the sort of green color is. Um, and that is to look for an ulcer. There were very pinpoint stain uptake, meaning there were very tiny ulcers present associated with this gray discoloration, but there was no evidence of infection or inflammation, which is great. And this, um, this finding is consistent with pinniped keratitis or inflammation of the cornea. Fortunately, this is something that can be managed with either topical or systemic antibiotics and pain medication. And because this is something we see in seals in captivity, they are often um, uh, trained to accept eye drops so it's again, one of those really important medical behaviors that can be trained so that they participate voluntarily in their treatment. So the last step of this procedure is to wake Sparky back up. So we kept him under anesthesia uh, and we brought him back to his empty pool. So obviously do not wanna wake him up in the water. You wanna wake him up on land. And throughout the entire re-movement, moving back to the um, pool, area, we continued monitoring all of his vitals. So you can see here that we have a portable anesthesia machine and we still have his monitors on him. So we can keep an eye on his heart rate and rhythm, 
his breathing and his CO2 output. Some of the drugs that we use to put Sparky under anesthesia actually have a reversal. And so we are able to give him his reversible agents and turn off his anesthetic gas. Once he started showing that he was waking up um, and when he starts swallowing, so we know he can protect his airway, we're able to remove the breathing tube so we can extubate him and then he can keep waking up on his own. We um, monitored him every couple of hours overnight just to make sure he was doing well. And as he had a wonderful recovery, we started his reintroduction to water the following day. These photos show us monitoring him during the recovery period. And as you can see on the right, this is after he has been fully extubated and he's nice and alert and recovering really well from anesthesia. So the next morning, we wanted to make sure that he was ready to go back to the water. So here you can see he is nice and alert. We're letting him choose whether or not he wants to go into the hose. He is exploring his environment. He's choosing to go into the water. Um, so we felt his, since he can move really well, he's got really good mentation, um, that it would be totally fine to start working back and getting him into the pool, get him back to his normal day. So here you can see he has been reintroduced to the water. He's swimming really well. You would never know he had been anesthetized the day before. So we we're really very happy with how he recovered. He clearly is feeling really well. His pain is well managed and he's happily swimming back in the pool. And this is his indoor pool. So the other question that we had for Sparky during his recovery is, since we wouldn't be able to feed him his normal full fish, we were wondering, you know, would he actually eat ground up fish? Um, would he take his medications? And so fortunately he was a perfect patient and you can see right away, he happily took these little fish and meatballs. Um, and so we were able to easily administer all of his pain and pain medications and antibiotics. Um, and he recovered extremely well. So you can even see him today back on exhibit uh, with his two friends. So with that, I'd like to thank Sparky, uh, the Henry Vitalis Zoo Animal Care Staff and Management Team, and UW Veterinary Care, uh, not only for all of their help with Sparky, but all the animals at the zoo. We know we're really fortunate to be able to provide such a high level of veterinary care to the animals at the zoo. Um, and with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Mary, you have such a cool job. You <laughs> Thank you. Really, <laughs> I mean, obviously it's so specialized and required so much training, but it is just a dream job. So thank you so it much really for sharing uh, all of this information with us. Hello, everybody. Fran Paleo Moyer, Badger Talks producer. Feel free to post any questions in the chat that you have for Mary. Uh, so Mary, starting back to the beginning of your talk, you mentioned Namibia, which was really like, wow, okay, we're on a different planet sort of there. Yeah. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about the animals that you cared for there and primarily what was, I guess, what was most surprising to you, if that's even possible, of, of what you saw there in terms of just the biology of the animals? Was anything surprisingly different because you were in such a, a different place? Yeah, great question. So that was while I was in college and we were actually just observing all of the native wildlife in their natural habitat. Um, every single animal that uh, came was just really remarkable and amazing to see and watch. Um, we were really fortunate to actually be in an area at a water hole that was not accessible to the general public. And so these animals were truly displaying all of their completely natural behaviors, which is just such an incredible experience. Um, I mean, some of the really unique things that I got to see were, you know, at nighttime, especially during the full moon, you could actually see the animals when they came to the water hole overnight and seeing some of those behaviors completely nocturnal was just something I'd never seen before. Um, a, a huge part of that project was observing elephant behavior and they're just such unique, really interesting animals. And um, we could actually individually identify all of the adults. And so learning about their relationships with each other and how they interacted, it was such an amazing experience. Um, Dr. Caitlin O'Connell Rodwell is the PI for that project and she's done some really interesting work. Um, I was so fortunate to get to work with her. It was a really wonderful experience. Wow, that's super cool. Uh, so you have these exotic flamingos behind you and I know <laughs> you train them to be so still. <laughs> yes, Just wanted to congratulate there. you on that. <laughs> Hopefully none, none of them have that avian malaria. <laughs> 
no, they're all healthy plastic flamingos. <laughs> well, <good. laughs> um, do you have, and I don't know, maybe this is taboo in the veterinarian world, but do you have any favorite animals that you work with? I guess the only good thing about animals is that they can't necessarily understand when I do share such private information. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I have to say that red pandas are almost always one of my favorites. Um, they're really great uh, patients. A lot of them can be trained for voluntary behaviors. Um, like one of the photos I showed was one of the females that allows us to palpate her belly, you know, see whether or not we could feel whether she's pregnant. Unfortunately, she's not. Uh, but she does also cooperate for awake x-rays and awake injections. So really um, just a cooperative patient and incredibly adorable. <laughs> Ah, that's, that's really neat. Uh, so Sparky is one very lucky seal, it seems. Uh, can you tell us if, so if Sparky was in the wild and he had all of these dental issues, would they feel pain just like a person would? And it'd be, so obviously there's seals in the wild probably suffering with all of these dental issues, which is why I'm thinking he's lucky, but could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, it's a great question. And there actually have been some studies looking at um, skulls from wild seals, and they definitely do have some of the same dental disease that we see, things like dental fractures. Um, certainly immediately when it happens, it can be painful. And if it gets infected, it can also be painful. Um, so um, it is something that we're really lucky to be able to take care of something like that in a zoo and we can relieve that um, potential source of pain or source of infection. Um, I think in, in the wild, um, it is something that is is a part of a natural part of their life, um, but of course, if we are able to treat it and prevent it, it's always preferable. Great. And can you speak? Sometimes zoos get bad raps, so can you speak a little bit to the importance of zoos? And I know you talked about this AZA species survival plans and conservation. Um, what role do zoos play in that part? Um, yeah. Important. Absolutely, a huge role. Um, zoos, zoos actually have, I think, close to like 200 million visitors every year. So that's just so many people that we can touch and educate, and you know, really inspire them to to contribute to conservation and to protecting these animals in the future, um, which is just crucial. You know, unfortunately, with climate change, a lot of these animals are losing their habitat, or with you know, forest deforestation and habitat loss. Um, we are losing these just incredible animals. Um, and having a zoo, having these animals in a zoo is really, for some people, it's the only chance they ever get to see these incredible animals in person. And so it really is a really unique opportunity to educate people. I think one of my favorite things about the Henry Vile Zoo is that it is a free zoo. And so literally anybody can come to the zoo and they can see these amazing animals and learn about them um, and get inspired to try to do something with their life, whether it's even as simple as like recycling um, to maybe going into biology or some sort of conservation research um, or becoming an animal, you know, a caretaker, working as a keeper at the zoo or even becoming a zoo veterinarian. Um, just different ways to try to inspire people to protect the animals and protect their land as well. Zoos are um, also Henry, really- that, Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, yes, that Henry Vilas Zoo is just a treasure uh, here in Dane County. Yeah, it, it really is. And I grew up Very going lucky. to it as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, zoos okay. are such an important part of conservation as well. Um, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, whether it's something like funding different research programs with grants, or even directly contributing to um, reintroducing species to their native habitat. So a really great example of that would be like the California condor. So they were essentially, you know, extinct in the wild. The remaining animals were brought into a zoo, um, a couple of zoos to breed them in captivity. And they've been able to be reintroduced to the wild and they now have an ongoing sustainable population in the wild. So such important critical conservation work is done um, in zoos really across the world. Well, I'm guessing with your very informative presentation today, and I have to say the, pictures and slides you shared were just phenomenal. Oh, thank you. Um, expected the great detail and it was just really very interesting. And I, I'm hoping we'll have a lot of teachers out there sharing this with classes. And it's just my bet that you're going to inspire some future veterinarians. Thank Dr. Wonderful. Ruther, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a wonderful experience.
Everybody, please tune in next Tuesday, July 27th at noon. We're going to be talking with Shireen Sherard Johnson, who is the Sally Mead Hans Bascom Professor of English. She's going to be talking about the practice of poetry and how African Americans have used poetry to chronicle protest and survive during times of struggle. She's also going to be talking uh, about her newest public co public collection of poetry called Grimoire. Also very exciting, uh, today we've launched the Badger Talks podcast, which is going to be hosted by Ben Rush, who also hosts the Deeper Than Data podcast. He's, uh, I love his style. He's very easy to listen to. The podcasts are only a 15 minute glimpse uh, into the passions and life of future Badger Talk speakers. So we're going to be launching with Shireen's talk with the podcast. So please, wherever you listen to podcasts, go out and search the Badger Talks podcast and listen to his wonderful interview with Shireen Sherrard. Uh, please visit badgertalks.wist.edu where you can see our upcoming schedule of talks, sign up for our email list, please consider a donation to continue our free programs, and you can search the roster of over 400 UW faculty and staff who have signed up to give talks both virtually and in now in person around the state. Thanks for tuning in and uh, on Wisconsin.